and welcome back to Rehydrate. This season, we'll be reading and discussing Isaac Asimov's Foundation Trilogy. This is Season 6, Episode 5, The Mule, covering Chapters 11 to 18 of Part 2 of the second book of the trilogy, Foundation and Empire. The hosts all have varying levels of knowledge of the book and the series, and my name is Dan, and I've only read up to this part. My name is Talia. I've only read up to this part. I've been avoiding the TV shows, and I am somewhat familiar with Asimov's work from The Gods Themselves. My name is Priya, and I've only read up to this part, and I've also watched the full first season of the Foundation TV show. Uh, Just a quick note for the show itself. Again, this is holiday times for the United States, for all of the hosts live, and scheduling is a little bit difficult with traveling and family obligations and stuff, so if if the episodes in the next couple weeks are a little bit delayed, sorry about that, but we'll get them out as soon as we can based off of our schedules. We're all very excited to read more. So just a little bit of uh, history for this part of the book. Uh, it was published in December, November and December of 1945 uh, as as The Mule uh, in the Astounding Science Fiction magazine. And I'll include a link to uh, a page on archive.org. It actually has like the scans of the original one. It's pretty interesting. It has some cool illustrations in there. Um, and the cover, I think, is really cool. Uh, and it looks like it's the, it's the cover story for for that magazine. So... But to get into the summary for this episode, we start out with the newlywed couple of Beta and Torin who arrive on Haven, one of the independent trading worlds. They are greeted by Torin's father, Fran, and his uncle, Randu. Torin introduces Beta, his new wife, who is a Foundation citizen. They speak frankly about the direction of the Foundation and how they're falling into the same trappings that made it inevitable that the Empire would fall. Fran and Randu are upset with the way the Foundation is treating Haven, specifically forcefully trying to collect taxes. Randu suggests that Beta and Torin go to Calgan to find a new warlord known only by his nickname, the Mule. On Terminus, Captain Han Pritcher of Intelligence is scolded by Mayor Inber, the third in the line of all powerful mayors. Pritcher has decided that he doesn't need to follow orders and instead thinks it's more important to investigate the Mule, as he sees him as the bigger threat to the state. The mayor gives him a direct order to go to Haven to collect the taxes, which Pritcher promptly ignores and makes his way to Kelgan. On Kelgan, Beta and Torin run across a clown performing on the street. Once the guards start to hassle him, Torin takes quick action to steal a gun away from the guards and protects the clown, saying that he will only give him up to the mule himself. Captain Pritcher finds the three of them back on the ship. Pritcher knows the clown, also known as Magnifico Giganticus, as one of the few people who have seen the mule in person. Magnifico describes the mule as an ultra-powerful mutant who can lift him with just one finger and can kill a person just by looking in their eyes. They decide to leave Calgan with Magnifico while they can to get even more information, but this was just a pretense for war that the mule had wanted to set up, broadcasting that the Foundation had forcibly kidnapped a member of his court. On Terminus, Iblingness, a psychologist, has determined through his research on Selden psychohistory that another Selden crisis is due in just four months. The mayor insists that there are no concerning reports that would indicate a looming crisis, just as he finds out that the fighting has broken out around the foundation. The leaders of 27 independent trading worlds meet and discuss the situation that has arisen with the mule. They are now worried about the speed of his advance and decide to join forces with the foundation to stop him. Nine weeks later, they all gather at the time that Miss predicted at the time vault for Zelda's next appearance. Right on schedule, he appears, but his predictions seem uncharacteristically off. Right then, all the power to the time vault goes out, and the news comes out that the mule has arrived on Terminus, and his ships are equipped with nuclear fuel depressors, causing power and communication to be cut. Mayor Inver feels that he's left with just one option, surrender. And for this week's cast of characters, we have Beta, a Foundation citizen who can trace her ancestry back to Mallow, Torin, husband of Beta from Haven, Fran, Torin's father, Randu, Torin's uncle, Mayor Inber, the mayor of the foundation, the third in succession, Captain Han Pritcher, an intelligence officer who takes it upon himself to find out information about the mule against orders, uh, the clown or Magnifico Giganticus, the former court jester for the mule, and Ebling Miss, a psychologist. All right, well, let's just start with general impressions. Talia, what did you think of this section? I think that we have actually been climbing up and creating more tension after the general I felt that there was more excitement and that has carried on into reading the mule I did prefer the scenes with the newlyweds who I think had more 
dialogue and more chemistry to the ones with just the generals and just the military aspect. But I think it built and yeah, I, my overall impressions were pretty positive and I can say more about that later. How about you, Dan? I loved it the, from, from the beginning until the end. Like I was very enthralled with the, the whole story, the way it was written. Mm-hmm. I think the characters are some of the best char- characterizations he's done in the entire series so far. Maybe, maybe only um, uh, Bel Rios was, was maybe more fleshed out. But I think like, yeah, like the, the newlyweds, the, the, the relationship with his father and his uncle, uh, Edling Miss was, was one of my favorite characters, <laughs> the way he kind of treated uh, the, the mayor and like, Edling Miss is like, he described himself as like a scientist and like, kind of like a, mm-hmm. you know, he, he kind of held himself in higher esteem because he's a scientist. Right. And so like, as a, as a self-proclaimed computer nerd, like I, you know, have like the same kind of like fantasies, you know, like telling off like the people in power and like saying like, I'm the person who knows all this stuff. Like you don't know anything <laughs> and, so, and just treating those people, you know, like with the contempt that he does, like, yeah, that, that it really spoke to me. <laughs> the sort of like, you know, fantasy. There you have it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like the, the I, I, yeah, I I love this whole, um this whole section. And how are you for you? I really love to hear that, that this really spoke to you because, um, though I cannot relate on a personal level, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I can, uh, I, I really, um, appreciated the insults that, um, both Inber and, uh, Ebling hurl at each other back mm. and forth. Um, it's very, uh, it's very much the kind of things that you might think in your mind, but not say, but they say them. So I, I enjoyed that. I, in general, I found that the dialogue was like so much more um, lively in this section. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, a lot of like variation of the types of conversations that are happening between characters. I found the character of Magnifico to be um, particularly interesting. And um, my only complaint with this section is that we didn't see more conversations happening with him because I feel like he is a very interesting character. And I feel like he has like a lot of information that I want to know. So, <laughs> so I like, maybe we'll see more of him later. I hope we will. I don't know. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. It, <laughs> it's almost too bad that like they, they didn't use the psychic probe on him, right? Like, cause they did the, the surface probe, got only like the little bit of information, but yeah, we want to know more about like what's actually happening in there. <laughs> but he, yeah, Miss is like saying, ah, he's going to blow a few, like this. It's funny. Like the way he, he like changes his tone. Like he's really like, compassionate to him and like saying oh you do it, it's no big deal and then like as soon as he gets out of the room he's like talks to the mayor like this idiot is like <laughs> he's like he, he, like really like demeans him and you know says like this this guy he was gonna blow a fuse if we use the actual psychic probe on him yeah on the one hand we have this like caliban like character he's disfigured or he's goofy or you know not really comprehensible but on the other hand like priya's saying he has so much of this information maybe prophetic maybe it's historical that they need and so it's very interesting to see them navigate that and I think it's kind of charming that we didn't know the other host's impression of this series but we all of this chapter rather but we all really seem to enjoy it maybe for different reasons I'll say like just kind of at a meta level I don't I didn't have any foreknowledge of this book and I just kind of split it up mathematically like I just like said like this is the first third of the book second third of the book and and third third of the book will be the the episodes for this thing but like the way that ends is like such a it really is yeah (laughs) yeah yeah I was really amazed at like where you just decided to um to break it off and I was like oh wow like it seems premeditated but I know I'm surprised that it isn't (laughs) It's all it's all part of Seldon's plan. Yes, exactly. We have our own Harry Seldon. <laughs> but yeah, that was so interesting. I mean, we've already spoiled to the end of this section, so we can talk about the end before we go through it more chronologically. But just ending with the uneasiness that you can imagine in that room and like the murmurs that turn to shouts that turn to outright violence and all of that is triggered by someone from 300 years ago being wrong is just really thrilling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause the whole foundation is built on like, you know, the uh, Selden being right. Mm-hmm. And even people who claim to not hold it in high esteem, they still count on it. They depend on it. So yeah, well done mathematics. <laughs> well done splitting it up. Yeah. I wonder if like he actually, cause like this, uh, it, it said like it was published in November and December of 1945. So maybe he split it up himself that way. Yeah. You know, I'll have to go back and look once we finish the, I, I didn't want to like read the end of it and like, get spoiled or whatever and now we can check out reddit and i'm sure someone has yeah <laughs> found out. 
and, and, and going back to the point about like the interaction between uh, Miss and the mayor, uh, I think one of the things that like made it even more impactful was like they had the chapter, a couple of chapters ahead of that where Pritchard was going in there and he was like, he was like really observing all the formality that was required of talking to the mayor, right? Like he wouldn't answer, you know, he only answer questions if asked and like not give any information. So you see like how much formality is, is imbued with like having to talk to the mayor. I think that will translate really well to the screen, that like big room with only one chair and like all these rights being observed. I think that will yeah. play really well. Yeah. And then like as soon as you, as soon as Miss comes in there, he just like throws the book out the window. <laughs> like mm-hmm. He interrupts him in this garden. He does whatever he wants to do. So, yeah. <laughs> And he just seems like a really good character in general. So I'm excited to see him if if the show uh, you know brings him in there. There's uh, one conversation in which they have like a very um, interesting insults hurled at each other, which I like jotted down because I I found them. I don't know. They made me laugh. Well, go on I think, then. I think Inber calls him a you lardish ball. <laughs> <laughs> and then he responds with you you wizened horror <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> I, think I, I, was I was like that just, I, yeah like who would think to call anyone that but alas we have it here <laughs> and doesn't he call him like a dotard yeah. at some point too yeah the, and then what, what was what was up with um all the times where um what was it i have it written down you you unprintable fool like wh- oh, i do remember that yeah. they mentioned like unprintable Un- many times. unthirstable unprintable yeah there's lots of interesting negation here <laughs> it almost reads like translation into english but it's yeah. just yeah just asimov yeah to me like that reminded me of uh of dark forest and the uh the imprinted people you know like yeah heinz his uh mm-hmm. his imprinting thing on his on people's brains that's reminded me of it <laughs> Ah, but imprinted versus unprintable. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what like Im- unimprintable. Like I don't know how that's an insult. I don't know where that comes from. Some uh, some forties insult. It well, was, it, was, it was used a bunch of times that adjective. So a lot of I was times, like, yeah. Oh, right. Like, what are they referencing? Something specific, or is it just like an like a an adjective a demeaning adjective for some I reason i sort of thought it was sort of like unspeakable unprintable mm, maybe and he also has the the his trademark galaxy that he says all the time <laughs> oh right did you understand that priya because that was like stylized when it was oh yeah that's true um, <laughs> it was stylized in the text when galaxy is spoken do you have any recollection of that wait say that again so Miss, like, he constantly says, like, galaxy or something, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> and he, and the, it's always written in the same way um, when he says With, like, it. capital L-A-X, maybe? Yeah, yeah. I have the book right here. Let me Ah, uh, see, these are the things you might miss when you're listening to audiobook. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I did not, I'm not aware of this. <laughs> yeah. I, it just occurred to me, too. <laughs> You would miss this, and you would also miss how to, like, you would have no idea how to spell names. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. These names are a little bit tough. Like, but Ty did a good job. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Earlier when we were talking about the word unprintable, uh-huh. um, turns out deciphering this was as easy as just Googling the word unprintable. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, something that's too offensive or shocking to be published. And then Collins English Dictionary says, if you describe something that someone has said or done as unprintable, you mean that it is so rude or shocking that you do not want to say exactly what it was. Hmm. So I guess defining it that oh, way. Oh, like George Carlin, seven words you can't say on television. <laughs> True. Yeah. So I guess calling someone an unprintable fool is like, he's just so um, like a shocking, shockingly foolish or like, just like, yeah, yeah like that, that too outspoken sense. maybe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That would have bugged me, so I'm glad I got that out of the way. Carry <laughs> on. <laughs> Shall we talk about some of these unpronounceable names, these characters, like uh, Beta? Yeah, I say let's start there. So Priya, you had uh, specifically, I mean, I think all of us had the same kind of feeling, but like you had been the most vocal about the lack of female representation. So now it seems like we have a real female character, and she's not just like some damsel in distress, right? It's like she has like real agency and it's like she has like a real backstory and she's, I don't know, the main character, but like definitely up there, like the mm-hmm. one of the main characters. So, I mean, like how, how did that strike you? Like having like, right off the bat, like a, a pretty strong female character in my eyes. And do you agree that she's a strong female character? I don't know about strong, but I feel like she is a good female character. Like she is, 
uh, fleshed out. She is, um, she's smart. She is, um, and, and, and I guess in that sense, that is her strength, right? Um, that almost like, like Asimov finds her worthy of writing. <laughs> <laughs> but like <laughs> it's it's very interesting to me when like other characters refer to her as girl like when they were talking to her and they're like oh girl like and that makes me think for once I'm reading that as if Asimov had written it to be intentionally cringy like like he like he wants us to see these characters as like demeaning her versus mm. he demeaning her you know so it read that way to me for and I can't exactly um tell you why but that's just how I read it like we're not supposed to find these characters um or rather we're not supposed to share this characters these characters views that like we should be talking to women this way so yeah that was a little bit uh refreshing for me to see after you know just uh chapters upon chapters of like male characters and just not seeing any kind of differences among them even at times like a lot of the characters seem to blur and blur into each other for me and beta definitely like stands out to me um i don't know if it's just because she's a female character but also because like in general all the characters in this section seem to be a little more interesting to me yeah and i think like the 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 rapport between her and her husband right i think that was also really good and like you can they weren't just like kind of more stereotypical like newlyweds like they're kind of like ribbing each other right like in the beginning they're going to haven and and she's like, oh, am I supposed to say that I love it here no matter what you want me to, where I want me to go? <laughs> you know, it's like, I think that the, the kind of interaction between them, you can, it, it felt like more like real people. That's what I commented on too, is Beta speaking, like her husband is musing, like, oh, well, this foundation actually could fail and still fulfill Harry Seldon's ideals because the foundation surviving doesn't mean that the current leaders have to survive. And he's making this grand philosophical arl, you know, argument and she's just like yeah what a waste of a good reverie that's the oldest <laughs> argument in the books <laughs> they're already so over it <laughs> yeah i thought like one of the interesting one of the things i didn't catch so i read this a couple times i read it at least twice and a little bit more than that mm-hmm. um but i didn't catch like beta's like reason that she joined the traders like uh, initially right so i went back and kind of did a little bit of reading and just kind of figure out like you know why is she joining them she's like from the foundation like why does she want to overthrow the the you know help the mule to like kind of you know stir up the pot right and so the quote i found is that it's saying it's almost a century since the last one and in that century every vice of the empire has been repeated by the foundation inertia our ruling class knows one law no change despotism they know one rule force now distribution they know one desire to hold what is theirs so going back it seems like the foundation or the the empire at this point has fallen or it's like it's basically not existent or not not a power in the in the galaxy anymore uh, but the foundation now is falling into the same traps and beta sees that and that's why she is willing to overthrow the you know help overthrow the current people in, in leadership and it seems like she thinks that he, that her and Torin can kind of, and maybe Fran and maybe some of the other independent people can kind of take, take more of a leadership position and, and do it right this time, right? I don't know if it's going to work, but that, that seems to be her, her thinking. Dan, it almost seems like you answered your own question about like why she decided to join because she's ambitious and yeah, it sounds like even though she's only, as she stated, like 24 years old, uh, five foot four, 110 pounds, um, <laughs> She's got a pretty clear sense of self and what she believes, you know, could be better. Yeah. Did did you did you all find like uh, having problems? Like, did, did you find the same the same problem of her motivations in the beginning? Like, it took me like to the second read to figure out actually what her motivations like, why she was going along with it. Maybe I just didn't read it carefully because there's like so much stuff thrown at you in the beginning. And I don't know if if you all had the same experience reading it. I kind of wanted to know more about her background because they kind of touch upon it a little bit and then um, you don't find out anything more. Um, I think it's that she like escaped from the foundation pretty much, right? So... Yeah, that part wasn't clear to me if she escaped or... I mean, it seems like she's some kind of rebel, right? I don't know how how vocal she is about her rebellion, right? But it seems like as soon as she gets on Haven, she's like really vocal about it. (laughs) But that, you know, she's in, you know, company that like-minded company at that point. 
Yeah. So I, I would have liked to like, like, see, these characters were also interesting to me. I wanted to know more of their like backstories. Yeah. And I think that was the one thing I was left hoping for and didn't get, at least not in these chapters. Like that, that makes it kind of really hard to really understand their motivations when you don't really have like origin stories for any of these characters. Um, so, and like, this is the first ch- first section where I'm actually like wishing for backstories versus with the other characters earlier. <laughs> I was like not really caring to have backstories. Mm-hmm. So that, that kind of says a lot. Like there's a lot of potential with these characters that could be further tapped into. I would agree with the potential. I think, again, this would translate really well to the screen. Uh, I think that just showing the contrast beter- between Beta and her husband would do the job of backstory it would show like some of the reasons or some of the departure because he clearly has been nursing a bit of this inferiority complex about not being from the foundation and I think it would help understand where she's from and why she's now here I agree there's a lot of like further exploration that can be done for these characters like on screen so yeah it'd be interesting to see yeah, uh, I, I don't know how they would tell the backstory of them. Like, I don't know if flashback would be appropriate or just more conversation, but uh, yeah. Or I, they can I, make it all up. Like they have made up a lot of things in the show, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but I meant or, like just like. maybe 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 they haven't. Maybe I just haven't read the parts of the books that those things are in. So uh, maybe yeah. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, I meant a bit more just like structurally, like how would they actually introduce the backstory, you know, like oh, at this, at, at, at this yeah. point, the characters have already been introduced. Like they haven't really done flashbacks that I remember. Like it's more like just like a line of, of events that happen. Uh, they talk about like their past a little bit sometimes in conversation, but it's always like in the present, not flashing back to what they're, what, what they used to do. But probably like another conversation on a ship or something would, would suffice right <laughs> yeah like or like a small flashback maybe like it depends on how much time they choose to spend with these characters i don't know how long the the book is going to spend with the characters and yeah. usually the sh- shows spend a different a varying amount of time with characters than books because like when you have characters that keep changing i don't know how if that translates as well on the screen than having like consistent characters, at least within the same season, at least. So yeah, it would be interesting to see how they do this um, going into future seasons. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I would assume because like, this is the first half of the part, part two, right. That like these characters are going to continue throughout at least the rest of this part. I don't know the rest of the series. Like, I don't know how, how it happens. There's uh, five other books after this, but one's a prequel. Um, but anyway, I don't know, like, if they keep expanding time the same way they have been, or they kind of just, you know, slow down and stay in these characters more. Mm-hmm. And another character that I wanted to bring up that was the mule himself, right? He's never shown. We never, never see him. But I think it's really interesting how he's sort of like a mythic figure. And he described, you know, the the clown, uh, Magnifico, describes him you know, as like this gigantic mutant who can lift people with one finger and kill people with his eyes. Uh, it's found to later not be true, but like no one knows him. No one knows his name. Only like very precious few people have seen him. Um, so I, I, I like the the kind of structure they're setting up of like this like really ominous figure that's that's gonna like destroy the foundation that no one even knows what it looks like. I thought this was very almost like funny. This is like an opportunity for both drama and comedy. Hmm. And the first introduction that we get about the mule is you know this very dramatic reading excellence he is known as the mules on page 124 he has spoken of little but i've gathered scraps of fragments of knowledge and winnowed out the most probable of them he is apparently a man of neither birth nor standing his father unknown his mother dead in childbirth his upbringing that of a vagabond his education that of the tramp worlds and the backwash alleys of space he has no name other than that of the mule a name reportedly applied by himself to himself to signify by popular explanation his immense physical strength and stubbornness of purpose. And then in response to this speech, it's like, all right, so what's his military strength, Captain? Like, never mind what he looks like. Like, how much of a threat is he? (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) So I just thought it was very funny because, like, speaking of, like, reveries, there's places where these characters are clearly on different wavelengths and call each other out on it. And I just thought it was 
part of what made this section so dynamic and interesting. Yeah, that that conversation between the the captain and, and the mayor was also pretty funny because like the yeah the, the captain would like give like these long speeches and like <laughs> yeah. and, and the mayor is like yeah I had the report you don't need to tell me yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly I also find it interesting how um, these descriptions of the mule only create more questions than they answer yeah. so like you you mm-hmm. never really feel like you're you're able to visualize who this guy is or you're able to understand who he is. You just kind of have like more questions and you don't have any clarity whatsoever by the end of these, like, you know, all these descriptions. Um, You're still left with a mysterious figure. And um, I find that interesting. And like, I hope that there is more exploration done there later in this section Yeah, in in the future reading. He's like, uh, he's like Kaiser Soze. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) One quick note, one thing I found was interesting was the they gave like a little bit of a hint of what happens to this the one of the main characters from the last part, uh who the, the Devers. And it says, uh, Devers died in the slave mine eighty years ago with your husband's great grandfather because he lacked wisdom and didn't lack heart. So pretty sad ending for Devers there. He was a pretty oh, pretty fun character. Yeah. He just apparently just died in the in the mines. R.I.P. Yeah. <laughs> uh so the next thing I want to talk about is the there's a common theme around how people just believe that kind of blindly that the foundation is going to win whatever challenge comes in front of them. And not only just win, but like win without doing anything. And we talked about that before too, um, how, you know, he might've written stuff to a corner because like every sudden crisis ends up with them winning it by not doing anything. And so th- there's a, there's a bunch of instances of this, but yeah, you know, I, I, and the quotes are kind of long, so I'm not going to read them all, but I just thought it was like interesting how that theme kept popping up about uh, people just uh, having more blind faith now that the foundation is just going to win and don't have to do anything. Yeah, it's interesting because um, we were talking about that last time about how um, uh, I was reading someone's opinion on this. Uh, it wasn't necessarily my opinion, um, but I was just loosely agreeing with it <laughs> um, that uh, Asimov has written himself into a corner because he's established all these um, precedents for foundation just winning automatically. What I tend to think about, you know, free will and the, these kind of uh, um, predetermined outcomes uh, is more in line with what we're seeing now, um, which is that we're seeing like a very we're seeing anomalies happening that don't fit with Selden's plan. And like like that's what I want to see. <laughs> like I want yeah. to see this. That's what makes it interesting. I feel like if 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 the outcome is already presented to you like at the beginning, then you're not so much interested in reading the book necessarily. But now we're seeing a more realistic uh, sequence of events unfolding and characters being introduced who throw a wrench in, in like these, these plans. So like, yeah, he's like literally a mutation yeah. of, of the, of the plan, right? Like they keep mentioning, exactly. like, oh, he's a mutant. So he's going to throw off the whole plan. <laughs> like, right. How could we, have, how could a Selden have predicted a mutant? And then, yeah, like the kind of everyone's like collective freaking out about Selden's like prediction, <laughs> like, like talking about something that didn't happen. You're like, what? <laughs> that, that didn't happen that did it in, in, in like uh what I, I forget who said it but like he asked like randu like did you want to start a civil war and he's like we we're going <laughs> to funny. but we, we didn't do it <laughs> that was yeah. great that was like oh we were gonna do that this was actually so funny <laughs> truly because like we enter in again with all of this drama and like this crisis is like pregnant it's about to breach it's days weeks away and then it's like, well, you know, we were going to, we, we were going to do a lot of civil war, but then we got sort of nervous. <laughs> so we yeah. changed our minds. <laughs> yeah. I, I think like it would have been far less interesting if Selden would come out and just did the same thing, right? Like he predicted the whole thing and like, if there hadn't been a twist, right? I think like the way that it's, it's twisting here is, is much it more It always does twist. This is the first time it just hasn't twisted in his favor. That's true. That's well, true. Well, unless we're <laughs> going to read the next section and the cliffhanger will be like, 
another Harry Seldon pops out from Harry Seldon, slits Harry Seldon's throat and says, <laughs> I planned this whole thing. Or it would be really, really funny if Harry Seldon were to come out and he were to start saying, well, let me tell you a little more about this fellow, the mule. Yeah. <laughs> oh. We're talking about the mule as if like he saw, he foresaw mm-hmm. this individual character right. all those years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So do you, do you think we're going to see the mule in the, in, in, by the end of this thing or will he remain a kind of a more mythic figure? It's kind of like, I mean, I can't help but think about how like, um, like I was frustrated when I was reading uh, Remembrance of Earth's Past. Sometimes like when some mm. characters remain shrouded in mystery, that's also like a, a storytelling device. And like, I wouldn't be completely like mad if like we never meet the mule, but he continues to do like very consequential things. But for my curiosity's sake, I want to know more about him and like, because a lot of interesting ideas around him were introduced, like the mutant aspect. And to be honest, I'm surprised that this is the first we're hearing of mutants because I would think that with humanity dispersed across so many different planets, um, so distant from each other, like out in space, you would probably have humans being subjected to a variety of different conditions involving radiation, DNA changes that result from that. And I'm like just surprised that there aren't more mutants that are known of. That's like a whole like subplot that you can like yeah. have oh. off of that, right? Like, I don't know. Yeah, I think you mentioned that in a, previ- a previous show also about like how the uh, by this time like we would have different versions of humanity like not not everyone would be the same kind of human right like you'd have these mutations and people living on distant worlds and so yeah it, it is it is kind of surprising that we haven't heard about quote-unquote mutants but the, I, I guess he, this one seems a little bit special you know but maybe maybe they're all just like they're all just like tales that people are telling each other right like maybe he just turns out to be a normal guy <laughs> you know when, when they actually meet him and like he just like kind of builds up like this uh, mythology around him that he's like super strong he's a mutant he can kill people with his eyes I- i'm i'm assuming if we do see him he's just going to be like kind of a normal guy who's really good at mil- military strategy for whatever reason is this a question you're asking no no i'm just my 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 theory oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry i totally misheard what you were saying i thought you asked us, like <laughs> who's really good at military strategy for some oh, reason yeah. i was like oh, yeah, yeah. not me <laughs> <laughs> bell rios another interesting mystery behind him is that there's continual talk about where he gets his ships who's supplying the ships right yes yeah and like the empire's more or less gone right the trader said they're not doing it so who else could be can be supplying in these ships and with advanced technology, my only guess here is it has something to do with the second foundation. They keep talking about second foundation. So it has to, has to be in here somewhere. And maybe the, the mule is from the second foundation. He, he's overthrowing like the first found or the our foundation. Oh, that's interesting. Because clearly he has some kind of like technology, um, advanced technology that you wouldn't expect him to have. So yeah, that's a good theory, I think. Yeah, this is interesting as compared to the other science fiction that these hosts have read together, uh, which is like in the dark forest, there's no real possibility for cooperation um, between different races or between these disparate groups because of the dark forest state of the universe. But here where the whole world is so uh, commercialized and economics has so much power, it almost like opens up the possibility so much wider. Like it could be a second foundation. It could be someone in the black market, like, It could be this DIY ship that he's doing. Like, we're not really sure about that. So that's a good point to bring up, Dan. I'm glad we mentioned that. And also what's very mysterious is, um, wasn't there a conversation where um, they were talking about how the Foundation's ships just kind of um, surrendered to uh, to the mule ship? despite being unharmed, um, which is very interesting. And it was also kind of mirrored by how quickly um in Burr decides that we should surrender like the moment the mule like sort of comes in he's like oh he faints and he's he wakes up and he's like surrender <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's it that's that's all that's all so it kind yeah. of mirrors what the ships are reported as having done that's true it's like sort yeah. of he's he's somehow 
coercing them into into doing what he wants somehow. Like we, maybe with the with the the field generator also it doesn't just turn off power, but it also like messes with your brain. Because they also talk about there's also that big section about the the Vizzy sonar where it actually like uh you know the, the the clown plays it and it actually like puts stuff into your brain right it like it you play it and then it like puts waves you know directly and the people are saying they close their eyes and they can see it better and they turn off the lights they can see it better so maybe that's like foreshadowing like people's brains being controlled and talk about they talk about the probes too so there's a lot of like stuff talking about that so maybe that's all connected somehow well, doesn't that totally remind you of like the the imp- the sofons like imprinting like the numbers oh, yeah. on their <laughs> on their retinas or whatever? <laughs> like yeah. immediately this, when you describe it that way, I think of that. This <laughs> reminded me of something from Dune. So, have the hosts caught up and read Dune yet? No, not yet. Oh, <laughs> sorry. When you do, well, think about the samuta. The samuta is not really talked about much, but it's like a narcotic drug triggered by it's like part drug, part music, and uh, you can form an addiction to it. And it's, you know, used, but it's used alongside the spice as well. Like it can be used chronically and forever. So mm-hmm. that's what I was thinking about as you guys were thinking about the Savons <laughs> and we were listening to the busy sonar and Dan was thinking about <laughs> Futurama. Yeah. <laughs> so I put that in the notes. Like my whole time I was thinking about it is like there's a, a- there's a thing that Fry plays called the holophoner, which is basically just yeah. like you play it and like the it, it has like a hologram of like some scene. And that was exactly what was in my mind <laughs> the whole time he was playing <laughs> that thing. And then I went back and like so it works. Was, it was in your mind. Yeah. It works. <laughs> and then as I was going going looking up um information about it, like they said like, Oh yeah, the business owner is just like the someone else said that too. So it's on the, it's not an original thought, but like I'm pretty sure that the holophoner and Futurama was inspired by the, the business owner here. Um, but it's still an it, interesting, interesting thing anyway. And like how, how um, Magnifico is a virtuoso on this thing. And like, you know, like saying, oh, you can play at Mallow Hall about, you know, into the whole city now and you can, uh, you know, entertain everybody. And, and Magnifico is really uh, intrigued by that. I guess he's, mm-hmm. he's a clown at heart. He wants to entertain. It's so interesting also um, in light of what um, Talia just said uh, about like that um, drug like quality of it, because I, I felt like when, when um that scene is described where um where beta sees the images the 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 way that it's written almost has like this kind of hallucinogenic quality to it yeah Um, i thought they were in danger absolutely during that scene yeah i didn't get i didn't get danger but i definitely yeah thought of hallucination well it, it it did feel kind of like they were having like uh sort of um not uh, like an experience that was not like tethered to like reality. So yeah, yeah, d- sure. danger in the sense that like something. Yeah. Like vulnerable, not tethered yeah. to reality and then closing their eyes. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'm just paranoid, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can, you can think about ways people can misuse that. Right. And maybe that's what the mule is doing. He's using the same technology yeah. throughout that. Yes. Again, this is just like a more suspenseful, more lively, more dynamic Asimov reading than maybe the entire first book of the foundation. Yeah. I mean, I still love the first book. Like I love all the stuff that, that it brought up and like the, all, all the interesting space politics that it brought up. But mm-hmm. this, this book so far has been, has been a much more enjoyable read. Like, you know, like the, the, the better characters, the more through lines of each story and like better this, dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. Better dialogue. Um, the plots are interesting. They build on all the stuff that like the, the world really feels like by reading that first book, uh, we really know about the world and like it, it, its constructs, you know? And so this feels like a natural progression, right? It feels, it doesn't feel, it, it feels earned, right? So good job, Eisenhoff. <laughs> <Finally, laughs> you did good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to go on record here saying Eisenhoff is a good author. I'm going to go on, on record here. <laughs> first first time this reference said probably. <laughs> wow. Only, f- only took us six seasons <laughs> to come up with the opinion. Cool. Yeah. I had a few other thoughts um, while I was uh, reading this part and particularly um, the the idea of being able to predict a future with absolute certainty. So um, as I was reading how they are kind of um, towards the end, how everyone is kind of mystified and by, by Selden's prediction being uncharacteristically off um, and like everyone's like hurled into a state of chaos. 
I couldn't help but think about how um, Avengers Infinity War. <laughs> and if you haven't watched it, don't listen to the next like 20 seconds. Um, I haven't. So I'm going to go off, but I'll be back in 20 seconds. I haven't either, but I'm, I'm not going to watch it. I don't like Marvel movies. <laughs> we do you not want, you really not want me to spoil this? That's it's, true. It's I don't really. really- like Marvel. <laughs> yeah, go <movies>. for it. <laughs> okay, it, it's it, out of context. It doesn't even really read as a spoiler. But um, so Doctor Strange is asked uh, how many futures he has looked into and how many futures they the Avengers went in. Um, and he says that he looked into okay, he looked into fourteen million six hundred and five futures, and um, he uh he said, and then the question is asked, how, in which of them do we win? And he says one. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, it kind of got me thinking of that because it's like you can have like such a high probability of like like one side winning or not winning or, you know, in the context of this, like a certain outcome happening or not happening. And um, despite that, you can have a tiny, 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 tiny probability that something different will happen. And I think that I always think about that when I think of um, the Selden crisis predictions and the outcome that he predicts is that like even if like he predicts it with like a 96 or 94 percent probability, there's still at like four percent or like like, you know, um, six percent chance that it won't happen. And then there are anomalies like the mule that can throw it off, which also reminded me of like the idea of the butterfly effect, which is like small perturbations having large effects on weather patterns. And then the analogy often being used on a larger scale for small, seemingly insignificant changes that can have larger consequences. And then the mule seems to be that variable that Selden couldn't have accounted for because um, often we hear talk about how he psychohistory can predict large group how large groups of people will behave but not like individuals so that always like sticks out to me as I'm reading these things and that's why like it kind of rubbed me the wrong way the last time when I was like the foundation will always win and I'm like but but like that's not the interesting story the interesting story is like a little Mm -hmm. small change or a little variable in the form Mm -hmm. of like a kind of loose cannon of a person setting everything off its track yeah yeah, yeah, and then everything past it like gets gets screwed up because of that, right? So like, he, yeah, Saladin's talking about, oh, there's gonna be a civil war between the traitors, and like, well, no, <laughs> there's like a the mutation that happened between that and that happens to be the mule. So yeah, I think that's it's also a very interesting point to me. It it, it makes the story a lot more interesting, and you know, the kind of more possibility, the unknown possibilities after that makes the story you know even more fun to read, right? Because now it's like, well, we don't know that the foundation is actually gonna win, or we don't know this foundation is gonna win. Uh, so what's actually going to happen, right? And so like now it's kind of like a more you know blank page of of possibilities. And like honestly, even if the foundation wins or were to make like a comeback after that, like this is a story that I'm more interested in because like I want to see how, right? Because it's 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 you've added more complexity to it in a sense. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening. Please check out rehydrate.space for release episodes, reading list, and pronunciation guides and all the other stuff we put up on the website. Leave comments by emailing us at rehydrate at fastmail.com or on Twitter at rehydratepod. And join us next episode for season six, episode six, Start of the Search, covering part two, chapters 19 to 26 of Foundation and Empire by Isaac Asimov.